society changes. Whenever there are major events in a particular country or region, society changes. Go back in time and you'll see this. In early church history, in the Roman Empire, particularly under Nero, there was an acceptance in society those days for Christians to be persecuted and even martyred. In the Victorian era in Britain, one of the more accepted signs of success for males included having a wife and family, having a good home, and owning a horse and carriage for transportation. When the Great Depression happened in 1929, society changed and people established new norms like thrift gardens in order to survive. After the 2008 financial crash, society changed. People began to diversify their investments, their savings, and how or where they kept their money. And just look at how many things that are widely accepted today, but 50, 100, or even 200 years ago, they were not the norm. Violence on TV, violence in music and in video games. This has all become the norm in society when many years ago, it was not as prevalent as it is today. Premarital sex was once taboo, but in this day and age, people are making a living having premarital sex and selling it online. These are just a few examples of changes that have happened in society over the years. But what does the Bible tell us about the changes that will happen in society to signal how close we are to the second coming of Christ? Well, the first change that I want to talk to you about can be found in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 and 2, where the Bible says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Let me just list these points to you. People in the last days will turn away from the faith, meaning there will be an apostasy, a falling away. And what does this look like? Well, it looks like less and less people attending church, less and less people professing to be Christians, less and less people practicing Christianity in their daily lives when it comes to things like prayer and reading God's word. People in the last days will pay attention to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. This is the point I want to focus on, so we'll come back to it in a moment. And people in the last days will be filled with hypocrisy and speak lies. This means you will have many who come saying and preaching one thing but living in a completely different manner. Then the final point is that people's consciences are seared, meaning there will be a coldness to humanity, a lack of love, a hardening of the heart, and this is all because of sin being prevalent in the lives of many. Now, I want to focus on doctrines of demons. Society in the last days will be more welcoming of new teachings, false doctrines, alternative gospels, and this is precisely what the Bible means when it says doctrines of demons. The devil will never come out in the open and present himself. Instead, he will use men and women to spread deceit. And here, here are some of the key messages from people who preach under demonic influence. They will tell you that you will get to heaven by being a good person and doing good things. God accepts you for who you are. It's okay to sin when you've been good for a long time. But God's word tells you that you cannot earn salvation through good works. Salvation comes only by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and turning away from sin. 
God's word tells you to deny self and to keep your flesh under subjection. And finally, the Bible tells you that the wages of sin is death. And so there is no trade-off between good behavior and sinning freely. So you see, these are doctrines of demons. Now, earlier this year, a report was published. Utah District bans Bible in elementary and middle schools after a complaint calls it sex-ridden. The article goes on to say, a suburban school district in Utah has banned the Bible in elementary and middle schools after a parent, frustrated by efforts to ban materials from school, argued that some Bible verses were too vulgar or violent for younger children. Now, the Bible says in Isaiah 5 verse 20, Woe, judgment is coming to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is what we are seeing. Good is now being called evil, and evil is being called good. The world is a very different place to what it was 20 years ago. There are many more threats that we have to contend with. Physical threats, emotional and mental threats. And of course, there are many more spiritual threats that we face today. Sin seems much more rampant and chaos is common. You look at the television, you watch the news and look at the entertainment industry and you'll find that there is so much hatred, idolatry, and pride that has infiltrated our culture. And if you're not careful, it's easy to be influenced, swayed, and even enticed by the evil around us. Despite that, Christians are called not to let their love grow cold in such a time of evil and sin. In Matthew 24, Jesus answers two separate questions that his disciples were asking him. The disciples asked when the fall of the temple in Jerusalem would happen and what would be the signs of the return of Jesus. Both are legitimate concerns for the disciples. One happened very quickly. That was the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, which happened in 70 AD, as the Roman army came in and dismantled Jerusalem. The other has yet to happen. That is the return of Jesus. In response to these questions, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 12, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. It is hard to tell whether Jesus is talking about the increased lawlessness happening before the fall of the temple or his second coming. He's likely talking about both. Whatever the case may be, there will be a time when increased lawlessness will happen. The goal of the Christian is not to allow the increased corruption to make our love grow cold we can see an increase in many areas of lawlessness today. Many take advantage of the poor to get rich. Many commit vicious crimes out of impulse for selfish gain. Many have a disregard for human life. And unfortunately, in some pockets, increased lawlessness can even be seen in the church. There are groups of people within the church who live a life of judgment. They will not embrace sinners who sin in different ways than them. Instead of showing love and compassion, they show self-righteousness and condemnation. We need to ensure that we are a people who do not let our love grow cold, but instead we must have a deep love for God. We do not want to be the very people who the Bible speaks of when it says the love of many will grow cold. So how do we make sure 
not to be included in this group. The only way to ensure our love does not grow cold is to continue having an active and vibrant relationship with the Lord. Many think that Christianity is a ticket to heaven. While it is true in the end we get to heaven, the Christian life is much more than that. The Christian life is about having an everyday, all the time relationship with the Lord. Jesus put it this way in John 15, 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. As we abide in the Lord, we grow in bearing fruit, and our love does not grow cold. We can and should obviously grow our relationships with the Lord through prayer, reading, and coming to worship services. However, one of the most critical ways to abide in the Lord is by living in a Christian community with one another. The Christian life was not meant to be done alone. It is when we live the Christian life in isolation that our faith often dies. A study was done where a single rat was put in a cage with a drug tablet. The study was to see if the rat would eat the substance. Every time a rat was put in a cage by itself, it partook of a substance. The isolation led it to the drug. They also put the substance in a cage full of rats. Every time the substance was in the cage with multiple rats, the rats ignored the substance as if it was not even there. While we are not rats, the same is often true for us. When we surround ourselves with Christian community, we are much more able to live a godly life. However, we are much more likely to let our love grow cold when we live in isolation. We live in very evil times. The world has always had evil and will continue to have evil until the return of Jesus. How are you combating that evil right now? Do you have godly Christian relationships? I suggest finding a group of Christian people to meet with at least once a month. It does not have to be a big group. However, these are the people you trust your life with. You share the good, bad, and ugly of your life with them. As you do that, you find a place where you can be open and honest about where God has you. Satan is trying to combat your Christian life by making your love for the Lord grow cold. However, surrounding yourself with Christian community, as well as reading the Word, praying, and going to Sunday services will help you abide in the Lord and combat that desire to turn from God in these evil days. So hear me, even though the hearts of many has grown cold, even if godly values, biblical values are no longer held to high esteem in society, I want to remind you that greater is he who is within us than he who is in the world. Jesus Christ is light, and he is the pure and holy light that drives out all the darkness. In Ephesians 5, 8, the Bible says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. The Bible says that we too once walked in darkness. Before we came to Christ, we were in darkness. But God, in His great mercy, opened our eyes to the truth of Jesus Christ, the author of all goodness and purity and righteousness. It is because of Him that we can shine, even among the shadows. Matthew 5, 14-16 You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. If you've ever lit a candle in a dark room, you know what a big difference that tiny flame can make. One small spark has the power and intensity to light up an entire room. 
The Bible says that is what we are like when we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. As a child of God, you are like a candle in a dark world. And when we all come together with fellow believers in one accord as the body of Christ, then we can really impact the darkness in this world through the light of Jesus Christ that burns within us. John 1.5 The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So how can we let God's light shine in us in our everyday lives? Well, 1 Peter 4.10 As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. In order to reflect His magnificent glory, God has given each of us unique gifts to serve His body. Some of us are encouragers. Some of us are teachers. Some of us are worshipers. The beauty of the body of Christ is that we all have different but vitally important roles to play. Whatever your gift is, you can use it as a powerful way to let God's light shine through you. So let the light of Jesus Christ shine brightly in you, even in the midst of great darkness.